Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to talk about a case that is a small win on the Section 74 battles that are happening across the country. And I think it's a win for Canadians generally, because I think Canadians would actually be quite concerned uh, if the principle here that was being advanced by the government of Canada were to be accepted. I think it's a very concerning idea in terms of how the courts should work. So let's have a look at this. This is the case of Tide or Teed. I'm not sure if I'm mispronouncing that. I hope I'm not, but uh, there's a number of other people, but that's just the name that ended up on top. All right, so this is a decision, uh, Provincial Court of Alberta out of Grand Prairie, and I'll try to cut out as much of it as I can, but I want to make sure everybody's got the gist of it here. So the applicants have all individually sought a reference hearing pursuant to Section 74 of the Firearms Act relating to a letter received by, uh, by them from the Registrar of Firearms. So this is once again one of these Section 74 hearings uh, based on this letter that uh, essentially specifies certain firearm registration certificates and claims that each of them are automatically nullified and are therefore no longer valid. So that's the position of the, uh, of the Government of Canada on this. So Section 74 of the Firearms Act allows the holder of a firearm registration certificate to refer a decision to revoke that registration certificate by the Registrar of Firearms, the Registrar, to a Provincial Court judge. Following a hearing of the reference under Section 75 of the Act, this court may either confirm the decision of the Registrar to revoke or alternatively may cancel the revocation of the registration certificate by the Registrar. As a preliminary matter, the respondent, the Attorney General of Canada on behalf of the Registrar of Firearms, has brought an application pursuant to Section 8.2 of the Provincial Court Act and Rule 3.86 sub 1 of the Alberta Rules of Court to strike these reference applications. And striking a reference application would mean that it, it goes away. It's gone and it's, for the Attorney General of Canada, that's a win. That They basically are bringing an application saying, you should stop hearing this and just declare us the winners. Canada claims that this court lacks jurisdiction to set a reference hearing under Section 75 of the Act, as the letter does not constitute a revocation by the Registrar. Canada relies solely on the record, which essentially consists of the reference form completed by the applicants and the letter. Canada maintains that the letter does not amount to the Registrar revoking a registration certificate. As a result, this court has no statutory jurisdiction to set a reference hearing under Section 75 of the Act, and the applicant's references should be struck. So essentially they're saying, you know, we want to hear this just on the letter and that there was no decision here. And so accordingly, uh, there's nothing that this court can review. That's again, their position. So that's scheduled for July 27th, 2021. The issue presently before the court is whether evidence in addition to the letter may be heard in Canada's application. The applicants, Mr. Teed and Mr. Weirden, seek to call evidence to provide an underlying factual basis with respect to which firearms are subject to the order in council passed May 1st, 2020, amending the classification regulations. In particular, they seek to call evidence in relation to how variants are defined, how bore size and muzzle velocity is measured, and how certain modifications to stock firearms can change their classification. The applicants, uh, Fowler and Fowler. I'm not sure if these individuals are related or if this is just a pure coincidence. Uh, seek to present evidence generally, although they appear to be arguing that they should be able to present the evidence that would be heard in the reference hearing itself rather than on the preliminary issue of jurisdiction in Canada's application. So what the court is talking about here is right now there's a preliminary application to strike uh, and that's just on the question of jurisdiction. So that's really all the court is going to want to hear on that application. They're not going to want to hear any evidence on the merits themselves. That's for a later step in the process. Canada is opposed to additional evidence other than the record. Canada submits that the proposed evidence is irrelevant or inadmissible to the sole issue in Canada's application, which is whether the letter constitutes a revocation decision by the registrar triggering the jurisdiction of this court to hear a reference under the Firearms Act. Now, I think it's difficult to say that the evidence is inadmissible because on a firearm reference hearing, the standard for inadmissibility is uh, relevance. So as long as the evidence is relevant, then it can be heard. Whether or not it's irrelevant, well, that's a different, uh, that's a different sort of test here. But it seems to me that the evidence presented or proposed to be presented here 
is relevant, right? If you're saying, if they're saying, hey, this gun is a banned gun and therefore, you know, it's, it's canceled. Well, how do you make that decision? You know, how is that decision made becomes important to illustrate that in fact, it has to be a decision. It's not just a thing that is magically happening for no reason. And when you think about this, the, the record is basically entirely the letter that's from the registrar. So no kidding, they're opposed to additional evidence because wouldn't it be great to have a trial where the only evidence that's heard is your evidence? You know, we are charging you with a criminal offense, Mr. Runkle. Okay, um, I would like it that the only evidence the court can hear on this charge is my evidence. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Or could you imagine, you know, the police, you know, the Crown says, oh, well, we're just going to call the police officers and we're going to bar the defense from calling any evidence. That sounds like a great process if you're the person who gets to present your side of the story, but it doesn't really seem like a fair process. And this is why I say this should be very concerning to Canadians generally, because if we allow this notion that the government can just sort of their side and their statement is the only evidence that can be heard um, and start applying this outside of the firearms context, you know, apply this to other decisions, immigration decisions, uh, business license decisions, all sorts of, you know, decisions that people make because people deal with the government and have disputes with the government all the time. This would be terrible. So I have serious concerns with this notion of like, oh, well, all you need is this letter that sets out our position for why we should win. And now nah, you don't need to, you know, cross-examine us. You don't need to challenge this evidence. Um, if it's wrong, tough. You know, you can't bring anything to show that this is wrong. I don't think that's how our court system should work, fundamentally. So the PCA and the regulations they're under do not provide a procedure for striking references or applications where no practice or procedure is provided to ensure the expeditious and inexpensive resolution of a matter. Section 8.2 of the PCA, that's the Provincial Court Act, allows this court to apply the rules and modify them as needed. So they can borrow the rules from Queen's Bench to apply them in Provincial Court as, as necessary. So rule 3.68 allows this court to strike out or set aside a claim where there's no jurisdiction or where the claim is frivolous for having no reasonable prospect of success. The rule prohibits evidence where the application to strike is based on a commencement document or pleading disclosing no reasonable claim or defense. So a commencement document is something that starts a lawsuit or a court process. Uh, in the civil sort of sphere, it would be a statement of claim, something along those lines. Uh, or if you're filing a statement of defense and there's no reasonable claim or defense, you know, if your statement of defense is, you know, I didn't do it because aliens did it, uh, that might not be seen as a reasonable, uh, you know, reasonable defense. But they go on to say there is no similar prohibition where the application is based on there being a lack of jurisdiction. And the absence of such a similar prohibition suggests that evidence, of course, should be able to be called. That's why the judge is pointing this out, is that if, if you say you can't call evidence in scenarios A and B, it kind of suggests that you can in scenario C. So that's, uh, that's the key bit here. While Canada maintains that the letter speaks for itself and no further evidence is required, the applicants or some of them maintain that the preliminary issue in the Canada's application comes down to what the registrar did or did not do with respect to the order in council and whether that amounted to a revocation decision. And I think that there's agreement as to that being an issue. You know, if the registrar revoked the license certificates, then obviously a section 74 hearing is available. The, there, the dispute is whether or not that actually happened, but that is kind of a factual, legal, complicated question. And, but because there is a factual element to it, it seems sensible to have some evidence on those factual questions, right? Canada's application must be determined fully and fairly. I think that's the crux of the issue. This sentence right here, it's got to be heard fairly and it's got to be heard fully. We can't just have one side or the other getting the opportunity to present their evidence. The Provincial Court Act envisions matters proceeding efficiently and inexpensively. 
These objectives can all be accomplished by allowing the parties, should they choose to have the court consider additional evidence, to file properly sworn affidavit evidence in these proceedings relevant to the issue of this court's jurisdiction to hear a reference hearing in these circumstances. So affidavit evidence is what the court is allowing. And you might be saying, what's an affidavit? Well, an affidavit is you put your statement in writing and it's a sworn document. And it being a sworn document is important because it means that it is under penalty of perjury. So if you file a false affidavit, uh, that's a big deal. The court can come after, you know, can come after whoever uh, files that or whoever falsely swears an affidavit. Uh, similarly, you know, as a lawyer, we have an ethical obligation not to present false affidavits to the court, um, assuming we know, right? Because sometimes you may not be in a position where you can possibly tell. But, you know, if we we should not be presenting false affidavits to the court, that's a, a serious issue. So affidavits are a big deal, notwithstanding the fact that they're in writing. They're essentially a written uh, form of testimony before the court. It's also quite common that on affidavits, you will cross-examine. So what that means is that after somebody has filled out an affidavit and submits it to the court, uh, they can be brought in to have a questioning on that affidavit, to be asked questions and, you know, provide answers. Uh, again, all under oath. All right, so Canada's application is scheduled for July 27th, 2021, is not a hearing under Section 75 of the Firearms Act, and that section does not apply to Canada's application or the evidence contemplated in this decision. So they're saying this is just a preliminary application to strike, so this is different uh, than the one I covered just recently, which hopefully I will remember to uh, put up here, where they said, okay, well, we're proceeding to the hearing itself on the question of jurisdiction. So this is a bit of a different kind of approach to it. And the fact that we are getting so many different approaches to this really illustrates that we're going to need some guidance from ultimately, I think, the, the Supreme Court of Canada. Said it before, going to continue saying it. This issue is going to end up uh, in front of the Supreme Court. So rather, uh, Canada's application is a preliminary application to determine if this court has jurisdiction to conduct a reference hearing under the Act. Any affidavit evidence properly sworn in these proceedings must be relevant to whether the actions of the registrar in providing the letter to the applicants amounted to a revocation of the applicant's registration certificates. So that's the court saying basically keep it on the issue of jurisdiction. The court is not at this stage hearing the merits. They're only interested in the jurisdiction question. So uh, that'll, that'll have to mean that all of the affidavits here go to the question of sort of what's involved in making a decision that a particular firearm is a prohibited firearm, that kind of thing. So this is essentially the court is not saying that, you know, we're going directly to a hearing. This is the court saying, we're going to hear your evidence on the jurisdiction question. And again, that's a fundamental question of fairness. I'm glad that the court is, is allowing that. So the parties are not required to provide additional evidence with respect to the application. However, should any party choose to provide further evidence relevant to the issue, it must be filed by affidavit evidence sworn and filed in these proceedings by no later than May 14th, 2021. To the extent such affidavit evidence seeks to refer to expert evidence, such expert evidence must be relevant to the issues in Canada's application, comply with the requirements of Form 25 of the rules, and contain the information required in Form 25. So this is basically just saying follow the necessary procedures. Should any party wish to question the party providing affidavit evidence, the same shall be done pursuant to, again, the rules of court, and they provide a deadline for that. And then there's going to be further briefs of argument and authorities. This is all just part of how the court goes. And they say Canada's application will be based on the record, any relevant evidence provided to this court, the transcript from any uh, questioning that is conducted, as well as the written arguments filed and oral arguments from the parties on the, uh, the court date. Oral evidence will not be heard in the application. So they're not going to have witnesses called. Um, I, I still have some issues with that. It seems to me that if they wanted to call oral evidence, they should be able to. Uh, this is a big deal, right? This is, if, if the parties here are not uh, successful in opposing this motion to strike, then they lose, right? And so when we, when the stake is 
the entire decision is at stake. You know, if if they lose this, that's it. That's the end of the, the case, except subject to, you know, appeals and that sort of thing. So I, I think properly they should really have as much evidence as they want to bring. But the affidavits should allow them to get in their evidence as necessary. So this is probably a workable compromise. Uh, when I say that this is a small win, they haven't won on the jurisdiction issue yet. You know, there's no, and there may not be a yet. This is, they may win, they may not. But it is fundamental to fairness that people be able to bring their own evidence, right? It's this notion that, you know, we're going to hear it solely on the letter provided by the government that essentially sets out their legal position. How is that, how is that fair, right? That's, you know, some... It's like if your landlord says, I'm evicting you for non-payment of rent, and you say, whoa, 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 I want to challenge that, and I've got all this evidence that I paid the rent. You know, I've got these canceled checks, I've got my bank account, I've got a letter from the landlord from, you know, two months ago thanking me for the fact that I've always paid rent on time. You know, I've got all of these evidentiary things that I want to bring to the court. And if the court said, no, 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 we're just going to hear this on the landlord's letter saying that you didn't pay rent and you can't challenge that, you would say that's a seriously unfair procedure. You know, I'm being railroaded in this. Um, it's sort of an important legal maxim that justice must not only be done, but it must be seen to be done. The public confidence in the court system in a large way depends on people being able to see court proceedings and be confident in them. Like you see a court proceeding and you walk out of that and you say, I may not agree with the decision because sometimes you're going to see decisions where you're like, I think the court should have gone the other way. But hopefully all participants can at least say, I understand why the court ruled that way and everybody got a fair hearing and everybody, you know, was on equal footing. And so even though I don't, you know, like the verdict or I don't agree with the verdict, at least this was a fair hearing. It doesn't feel like a fair hearing if one side is prevented from being able to, to, you know, show why they think they're right. That's the whole reason we have courts, is that both sides get a chance to show why they think they're right. And if we take that away, what do we have left? You know, how can we have confidence in the courts? So I'm really glad to see these decisions that are saying, yes, evidence can be heard. Uh, it's This is going to be a big, long battle. This is years in the making here. So we'll have to see, uh, we'll have to see ultimately how it shakes out. But uh, yeah, as I've said before, this is going to end up at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's going to have to look at all of the different approaches that have been taken in different jurisdictions. So all of this stuff that we're doing right here now in these videos, looking at these different decisions and saying, okay, this court is ruling this direction for this reason, and this court's going in this other direction for this other reason, all of that is eventually going to be heard and considered, I expect, uh, by the highest court in this land. So it's really kind of interesting and exciting to be able to watch the case develop from the ground up. Right. This is a, a rare opportunity here where where we can sort of see that this is a big issue as it's happening. So I I find this to be fascinating. I think this is really cool. Uh, I recognize that part of why I think that is because I am a massive, massive law nerd. But I hope that uh, some of you guys at least are as excited about seeing all of this as I am. Um, I also know that a lot of my viewers are gun owners like myself, and so we all have a stake in this. Thank you for watching. Uh, please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to see more content. All of these things help the channel grow. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. Uh, it's a big help. At the $50 level, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Jason Elliott, Canada's National Firearms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint and Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited. And at the $20 level, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, and Andrew Elsich. Also a number of you at the $10 level. Uh, they'll be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you once again for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge. <laughs>